Welcome to Education Matters, presented by the Public School Forum of North Carolina. I'm Tara Lynn. Did you know that North Carolina is home to 568,000 rural students, the second largest rural student population in the United States? That's after Texas. Well, this fall, the Public School Forum will convene its 17th study group to better understand the unique needs, challenges, and strengths of rural school districts all across the state. It is a critically important undertaking because in the years following a court ruling known as Leandro, the state has fallen short of its constitutional obligation to ensure sure that all children, including those who are from rural and underserved communities, have access to a sound basic education. Today on the show, we will hear from two co-chairs of the forum's study group focused on rural education, as well as a board member of the Rural School and Community Trust. That's a national organization devoted to the relationship between good schools and thriving communities. Before we tackle our main topics, we open with headlines, our quick scan of education headlines across North Carolina and the U.S. Last week, North Carolina lawmakers made changes to the controversial innovative school district that creates a new process for how low-performing schools will be chosen to be placed in the ISD. Legislation that passed both chambers of the General Assembly would require just one school to be included in the ISD next year instead of four schools. Conceived to operate multiple struggling schools in a bid to help them improve, the ISD has operated just one low-performing school in Robinson County since its creation and has yet to produce any meaningful improvements in students' academic progress. Last month, the Winston-Salem and Forsyth School, School Board rejected a proposal to make an African-American history class mandatory for high school students as part of a recently adopted infusion plan in order to offer multicultural classes. In the discussion leading up to the rejection, Board Chair Melisha Woodbury asked other board members to be prudent in their decision because the district superintendent cautioned that there was not enough data to support the mandatory course. The decision sparked mixed reactions, with many emphasizing the need for a more diverse curriculum. Well, known as the nation's report card, the 2019 NAEP results released last week found that the percentage of students achieving basic reading skills in North Carolina is now lower than it was in 2011. That is just one year before state lawmakers instituted the Read to Achieve initiative to raise the number of students reading on grade level in the third grade. Now, the dip in scores does mirror a nationwide drop that has taken place over the past eight years. A bright spot, though, in that data really shows that fourth and eighth grade students did see an increase in reading proficiency scores since 2011. Remember, you can visit the Public School Forum's website at ncforum.org. Click Education Matters and read more about each of the headlines as well as other topics that we cover each week. Well, as I mentioned at the top of the show, today we're going to hear from two co-chairs of the forum's new study group focused on rural education. We're going to speak with Patrick Woody, president of the North Carolina Rural Economic Development Center, as well as Dr. Jenny Korn with My Future NC. But for our first segment, I would like to introduce you to Alan Richard, board member of the Rural School and Community Trust. This is a national organization that is addressing the crucial relationship between good schools and thriving community. So thank you so much for joining us this evening. Great to be here. Now, I know one of the things um, as a board member for this uh, group, you guys are focused on uh, really uh, bridging the gap and uh, strengthening those rural schools in North Carolina. Um, you guys have a report actually coming out next week called Why Rural Matters. This is gonna look at rural education across the nation. Um, why do you guys uh, put this report together? What has it been able to show you over the last couple of years. We do this report at the Rural School and Community Trust because rural really does matter when it comes to education across the country. About 9.3 million students across the country attend rural schools. That's more than in the 85 largest school districts across the country combined. So New York, Chicago, Los Angeles, and 82 more school systems. There's more rural kids than all of those kids. And when we talk about rural schools, I know a lot of times, you know, we're, when we're looking at different populations in the school group, we hear maybe low income or those who have to be on free and reduced lunch. What does it mean to be classified as a rural school district? Our definition of rural follows the U.S. Census. So there are tracts of land throughout the country. It's how we know what the population is. And those tracts are identified as rural by the census. We identify as rural in our report. You know, most of us don't really realize the challenges that rural schools face, even if we have rural roots. I have small town roots in South Carolina. Um, but most people in Wake County and Mecklenburg County don't really know what it's like 
in small town or rural schools in the mountains or in the, in the eastern part of the state. And so when we're looking at sort of that difference between the rural schools and uh, I guess what we would consider urban schools, uh, one of the, the things that we're looking at uh, here, particularly in North Carolina, is the struggle to equally distribute resources. Um, can you talk a little bit about that, that struggle and, and how it does sort of uh, widen that gap between the rural and the urban schools? Absolutely. Our report ranks the states in terms of their highest need in rural education. And North Carolina's ranking, I'm previewing the report that's going to come out next week, is actually now number two in the country, is the second highest need state in terms of improving rural education, behind only Mississippi and tied with Alabama. Uh, one of the main reasons for that in North Carolina is funding. The state spends about $6,400 a year per student on instruction in rural schools. That's about $1,000 below the national average. Um, New York, for example, spends, um, I'm sorry, nationally, it's about $6,400. Mm -hmm. In North Carolina, it's about $5,400. And New York State, for example, spends uh, more than twice that amount on rural schools, rural students instruction in their state. So I wonder, you know, why does rural, why do North Carolina's rural students matter so much less than rural students in other states? Money isn't everything, but it sure is something, and it can help provide the teachers, uh, provide programs that support educators and educational programs that students need in rural areas. And I guess what, you know, when you look at that, I mean, uh, you're, some people could say, well, the state's spending the same amount of money, I guess, on, on all of the students, but still, where do we, if we had the additional funding, where do you, where do you put it to help close that gap? Well, this is the focus of the Leandro case, right? Um, it's not just the state funding, it's the local funding. And in many parts of rural North Carolina, there are very few businesses and homes to tax. So you might have a very high tax rate in many rural areas, but the amount of money that can be raised to operate schools is very low in some places. Uh, the state has to make up the difference for that. It does in some cases. It has a little provision to help out with that. But in the rural trust mind, it's certainly not adequate. Um, and also, I would think that we could set our sights a little higher than just a sound basic education. Um, but of course, on some, unfortunately, some rural students out there aren't even getting that. And I know one of the biggest achievement gaps, and of course we've seen it with um, uh, just in the headlines this week, is uh, looking at the reading. Um, and uh, not great news all across North Carolina, but we're also seeing that being one of the biggest gaps when we look at um, the rural and uh, sort of the urban communities there. Is any way to sort of pinpoint why reading is maybe the biggest gap there or what can be done? I don't know about reading specifically, but obviously that reading is foundational. Um, North Carolina is one of only four states, uh, let's see, no, North Carolina's rural students um, actually do worse than their non-rural students on the NAEP exam. You mentioned the mm -hmm. NAEP test in the headlines. That's the national exam. We saw the results from that this week. Um, North Carolina is consistently better. North Carolina's urban and suburban students are consistently better than those students uh, nationally. But your small, your small town and rural students in North Carolina consistently score at or below the national levels for those students. So one, North Carolina is one of the few students where rural students don't do very well on achievement. You're actually behind the curve in some ways. And I know uh, one of the things uh, we're looking at too inside the rural school districts um, here in North Carolina, they're actually fairly diverse. Um, what sort of role does uh, racial diversity play in um, and how these schools kind of perform in the makeup and what opportunities these students have? Our report shows that actually North Carolina's rural schools are more diverse than many other rural schools across the country. Um, it's North Carolina is one of only four states in which students are likely to attend school with another student of a different mm -hmm. racial or ethnic background. Um, it's about 54% 50, of students have that opportunity according to federal data. It could be higher. Some places in rural North Carolina definitely battle racial segregation in the rural schools as well. Um, but it's something to build on, and it's, uh, you know, you're ahead of the game in some states when it comes to rural schools and diversity here. Of course, we've talked a lot about uh, some of the, the downsides or some of the challenges that these rural schools face, but what are some of the benefits of growing up in, uh, I know many people, they'll tell you, oh, I love growing up in a small town, um, but what are some of those, uh, maybe the benefits that we can see within the school district of being rural? Well, rural schools are often smaller. 
Um, they're welcoming environments. They're the place, the kind of places every, where everyone knows each other, and it's, they're the kind of places a lot of families would want to send their children to school. So there's a lot to build on there. There's lots good about rural. I wouldn't give anything for my small town and rural upbringing in South Carolina, but I deserved better opportunities with my education, and there are a lot of kids who were far worse off than I was. So, um, so we've got a lot of we've got a lot of work to do, but there's something to build on. Rural is rural places are wonderful in North Carolina. They're certainly beautiful here, um, and so let's just offer. We can do a little bit more by investing in our kids a bit more to offer them the kind of educational opportunities they deserve. And with the work that you you guys do specifically looking at these rural schools, um, can you talk a little bit more specifically about maybe some of those um, the gaps? Is it a lack of um, you know computers or technology being able to be in the classroom? Is it um, you know are there less advanced classes like uh, for the AP exams and um, those types of courses? What is, what is the one thing maybe we could do to, to make the biggest and quickest improvement? Well, I would I would add that we you know we need to invest more because uh, again money isn't everything but it is something and it does get you uh, additional educational programs only about eight percent of North Carolina's rural students pass advanced placement exams you know so very few students out there have opportunities for those kinds of rigorous courses that really prepare you for college um, North Carolina has a very high child poverty rate of more than one in five students in rural schools in North Carolina come from from high poverty homes. That's not just low income, that's seriously intensive poverty homes. Um, and so unfortunately, some of it sometimes, the students who may need the most help and support actually get the least, right. which doesn't make a whole lot of sense. And I think we can do better. Um, a little bit would go a long way. Well, I know we're, uh, we will find out a lot more next week when the report comes out. Yes. So uh, thank you so much. I certainly appreciate you being with us. Oh, thank you, Tara. All right, after a brief commercial break, we will be back to continue our discussion with two of the co-chairs of the forum's study group on rural education. But first, see if you can answer this question. How many of North Carolina's 100 counties are classified as rural? Education Matters is brought to you each week in part by Paragon Bank, serving others, enriching lives. Welcome back to Education Matters. Well, did you correctly answer D? 80 of North Carolina's 100 counties are classified as rural. In addition to that fact, 40% of all North Carolina public school students reside in rural counties and 87 of the state's 115 public school districts are located in rural communities. Well, joining us now, we have Patrick Woody, president of the North Carolina Rural Economic Development Center, as well as Dr. Jenny Korn with My Future NC. So thank you guys so much for being with us. Thank you. Uh, I'm going to start, Patrick, with you okay. with, uh, excuse me, uh, yes, Patrick, <laughs> uh, with one of our first questions here as we look at those statistics of just how much um, and of North Carolina students and schools are considered rural, why should um, those not living in the rural communities care about what's happening there? Well, I think all of us want to be part of a really vibrant state, and we certainly are a growing state, one of the fastest growing states in the country, and we can't be a strong state with a strong economy if we leave 43 percent of our population behind. Uh, North Carolina has 4.3 million uh, residents uh, living in rural communities. Um, and so it's really important with the second largest rural population in the country, um, we've got to think about the unique needs of those rural places and they are different uh, from urban and suburban North Carolina. We also have 500 rural student, 500,000 rural students that live in those rural communities and so it's really important. I think we understand that uh, the rural workforce is also integrated into the state's workforce and the metropolitan workforce. We're right now at a period of time where the labor market is very tight and, and, and employers are struggling to find employees um, and we would be in what, much worse shape if it were not for the, the number of rural workers that actually travel into an urban or suburban community every day to work. I know we've talked a little bit about uh, the diversity in North Carolina in general, yeah. but the diversity um, being fairly strong in our rural communities, but just because they are maybe more diverse than some other states, mm -hmm. uh, the uh, diversity not necessarily uh, distributed evenly. Can you Correct. talk a little bit yeah. about that? So um, I think we we think of, of, of rural North Carolina as, as being an older white, or, or rural America really, as being old and white. And certainly there there is some truth to that, but when you think about rural North Carolina, 
uh, and you look at the numbers across uh, race uh, across the state, uh, rural is only slightly less diverse than the, the state as a whole. We are poised to have 25 majority minority counties. So one quarter of all the counties in North Carolina, we're right on the verge of, 20, of one quarter of all the counties in the state being um, majority minority counties and 19 of those are rural counties. Uh, it's just that that diversity is not evenly d uh, distributed across the geography of the state. It really depends upon where you are. Um, and it also depends upon how old you are. So the younger you are, and certainly that school age population is a much more diverse population than older age groups. Okay, and Jenny, I know you recently joined the team at My Future NC, mm -hmm. and one of the main goals for you guys is closing the educational attainment gap by 2030. Can you talk about this particular goal and, and how it relates to those rural schools? Absolutely, so My Future NC was kind of born out of this cross-sector commission work that went on. It was leaders from our ed different education sectors. It was business. It was philanthropy in North Carolina that really cared about the state of education in North Carolina and being that economic driver. We know that across the board, if you want to get a good job, you're going to need some education after high school. So we wanted to take some time and really think about what were the national experts able to tell us, mm -hmm. really kind of leverage our in-state researchers and the data that we had available. And so we did this work and identified this goal. For our rural communities, what we know is we they need the exact same access to educational opportunities no matter what your zip code is. One of the kind of the data and statistics that really sticks with me after doing that kind of first bit of work with the commission was only 30% of North Carolinians that start in ninth grade in our public high schools graduate from high school and then go on to get a degree or a certification. 30%. That mm -hmm. is, you know, that is not enough and it's even worse in our rural communities. So that work really is focused on helping to kind of galvanize public education, have a conversation about what our rural parents, what our rural communities should be expecting of their high school students, of the adult workers, and really looking for opportunities to graduate from a cert certification or degree program so they can get a good job to drive kind of that work in, in the rural parts of our yeah. state. And you guys have both um, are uh, co-chairs, uh, uh, four, four chairs uh, with the uh, committee to put together this uh, report by the Public School Forum. And uh, it's released each year, and the report looks at the local school finances. Um, and it found that in 2016, 2017, that the 10 poorest counties actually taxed themselves nearly double the rate of the wealthiest county. So there's about a 37 cent difference there. But even with that, um, basically doubling the tax rate for those rural um, counties, there's still a huge gap in between uh, mm -hmm. the, the achievement and I guess uh, some of the results that we're seeing. Um, can you talk a bit about, I mean, how do, how do you fix that? <laughs> can you well, fix it? Well, you know, the reality is, uh, from a rural standpoint, we, we deal with some really persistent challenges that are always there, and capacity is one mm -hmm. of those. And so you can tax and raise that tax rate as high as you want to raise, you know, as high as you want to raise it to try to really generate the income that you need to meet the needs of the community, but the people living there would not be able to afford to pay that. Um, and we look at, at a lot of counties around the state, for example, Swain County, very rural county in western North Carolina, you know, 80, 85 percent of Swain County is owned by the federal government. So when it comes down to mm -hmm. how much taxable land do they really have, it's pretty limited. Um, and so there's only so much you can do in terms of taxing authority. Uh, so rural communities have got to have partners and they've got to have um, other uh, at the state level, at the federal level, that are really willing to help address those funding disparities because there, there is a limit to what locals are able to do. And certainly, we, we strongly believe localities should do their part, um, and I think for the most part they do. You'll find uh, that many rural communities pay far higher taxes and, and yet have much lower median household incomes than their urban and suburban counterparts. And Jenny, I know one thing um, your group looks at too, the, the skills gap, and part of that's kind of, I guess, chicken and the egg in terms of you want to be able to recruit uh, mm -hmm. great businesses um, to the area, but they also have to be able to have uh, the workers to, to fill the jobs there. Mm -hmm. And I think in our rural communities, the, the core driver for a lot of that meeting the skills gap, being responsive to incoming industry and existing industry is our community college system. 
our community college campuses are such a core leadership kind of mm -hmm. hub for our rural communities that we're really looking to them. Um, we've been really fortunate with the My Future NC Commission and, and kind of transitioning into My Future NC to have a lot of cross-sector work where we've had our independent colleges and universities, our community colleges, our, you know, our state-funded UNC system, and all working together to try to meet those, meet those skills gap needs and making sure that the rural, the rural communities are part of that conversation. And I know that's part of your group's goal with um, ensuring that two million North Carolinians uh, be able to have that the high quality uh, post-secondary degree or the, the credentials by the year 2030. Mm -hmm. So as we look ahead to, uh, you know, 11 years of almost, I guess, 11 years and two months, or what, mm -hmm. 10 years, two months, I'll give you that yeah. extra two months mm -hmm. to achieve that I mean what what do you think the rural communities need well that's a really uh, it's an ambitious goal mm -hmm. it is is it's also a, a very correct goal for the state of North Carolina it's really something we need to achieve it's going to be harder as Jenny's already referred to that it, it's it's going to be harder to achieve that in, in rural areas when we look at uh, some regions of the state you'll find that there are metropolitan areas that are already close to or mm -hmm. even above the well above the state average and close to meeting the attainment goal while there are rural communities that are below the state average and a long ways from meeting the state attainment goal it's going to take different strategies are going mm -hmm. to work better in those rural places uh, there's no question, and I totally agree with Jenny, uh, we believe the most undervalued asset that we have is our community college system. And even saying that, I believe we place a very high value on that, <laughs> on that system, but, but, but not high enough. We got a lot of work to do, and the answers for rural communities are going to be different from the answers for other places. Mm -hmm. But I will say, too, so what we're talking about with this 2 million by 2030 is like business as usual doing everything we're doing right now projections would have us at at 2030 by i think 1.6 million mm -hmm. so we're talking about 400,000 North Carolinians that are better able to provide for their families, that are better able to kind of have these rich communities driving economic development. I mean, it's something I think all of us can get behind. You know, Absolutely. I love this yeah. state and I want to make sure that no matter where you live, that you really do have a great opportunity to provide and this is how we're, we really want to help help do that. Of course, be, get, being able to have these reports and get the numbers and know where we need to go and close the gap certainly helps. Thank you guys yeah. so much. Mm -hmm. Thank you. All right, after this, we will have this week's final word. For more than 30 years, the Public School Forum has published research that shines a bright light on local spending on public schools across North Carolina. Recently, that research has uncovered a troubling trend. There is a widening gap between wealthier counties and those with lower levels of wealth, often rural ones, leading to vast disparities in counties' ability to provide their schools with the resources they need. This gap has persistently grown as adequate funding from the state to, clo to close the gap has failed to materialize. These funding disparities have tangible impacts on North Carolina's classrooms and make it exceptionally difficult for rural school districts to ensure that all children have access to a sound basic education, something that our state constitution mandates and that our children deserve. In the wake of a court ruling that was handed down decades ago, the state is still striving to meet the constitutional obligation of equitability fund our public, our public schools as outlined in the Leandro decision. Now, North Carolina once again at an important crossroads here. Soon, a court order report will publicly outline the steps North Carolina needs to take to fund its public schools adequately and equitably. It is the public school forum's hope that our state leaders take the steps outlined in this report to heart and make changes to funding our system so that every child in North Carolina, whether she lives on a farm or in a bustling city, has equal access to high quality education. That's it for this week's show. Thank you for watching. We'll see you next week.